Chapter 8 The Three Friend His companions had passed on whilst he was at his orisons, but his young blood and the fresh morning air both invited him to a scamper. His staff in one hand and his scrip in the other, with springy step and floating locks, he raced along the forest path, as active and as graceful as a young deer. He had not far to go, however, for, on turning a corner, he came on a roadside cottage with a wooden fencework around it, where stood Big John and Elwood the bowman, staring at something within. As he came up with them, he saw that two little lads, the one about nine years of age and the other somewhat older, were standing on the plot in front of the cottage, each holding out a round stick in their left hands, with their arms stiff and straight from the shoulder, as silent and still as two small statues. They were pretty, blue-eyed, yellow-haired lads, well-made and sturdy, with bronzed skins, which spoke of a woodland life. Here are young chips from an old bow stave, cried the soldier in great delight. This is the proper way to raise children. By my hilt. I could not have trained them better had I the ordering of it myself. What is it then? asked Hordle John. They stand very stiff, and I trust that they have not been struck so. Nay, they are training their left arms, that they may have a steady grasp of the bow. So my own father trained me, and six days a week I held out his walking staff till my arm was heavy as lead. Ola, Miss Unfans. How long will you hold out? Until the sun is over the great lime tree, good master, the elder answered. What would you be, then? Woodmen? Verderers? Nay, soldiers, they cried both together. By the beard of my father. But ye are whelps of the true breed. Why so keen, then, to be soldiers? That we may fight the Scots, they answered. Daddy will send us to fight the Scots. And why the Scots, my pretty lads? We have seen French and Spanish galleys no further away than Southampton, but I doubt that it will be some time before the Scots find their way to these parts. Our business is with the Scots, quoth the elder, for it was the Scots who cut off Daddy's string fingers and his thumbs. Aye, lads, it was that, said a deep voice from behind Aline's shoulder. Looking round, the wayfarers saw a gaunt, big-boned man, with sunken cheeks and a sallow face, who had come up behind them. He held up his two hands as he spoke, and showed that the thumbs and two first fingers had been torn away from each of them. Ma foi, camarade, cried Elwood. Who hath served thee in so shameful a fashion? It is easy to see, friend, that you were born far from the marches of Scotland, quoth the stranger, with a bitter smile. North of Humber there is no man who would not know the handiwork of Devil Douglas, the Black Lord James. And how fell you into his hands? asked John. I am a man of the North Country, from the town of Beverley and the Wapentake of Holderis, he answered. There was a day when, from Trent to Tweed, there was no better marksman than Robin Heathcote. Yet, as you see, he hath left me, as he hath left many another poor border archer, with no grip for bill or bow. Yet the king hath given me a living here in the Southlands, and please God these two lads of mine will pay off a debt that hath been owing over long. What is the price of daddy's thumbs, boys? Twenty Scottish lives, they answered together. And for the fingers? Half a score. When they can bend my war bow, and bring down a squirrel at a hundred paces, I send them to take service under Johnny Copeland, the Lord of the Marches and Governor of Carlisle. By my soul! I would give the rest of my fingers to see the Douglas within arrow flight of them. May you live to see it, quoth the bowman. And hark ye, mes enfants, take an old soldier's reed and lay your bodies to the bow drawing from hip and thigh as much as from arm. Learn also, I pray you, to shoot with a dropping shaft, for though a bowman may at times be called upon to shoot straight and fast, yet it is more often that he is to do with a town guard behind a wall, or an arbalestier with his mantlet raised when you cannot hope to do him scathe unless your shaft fall straight upon him from the clouds. I have not drawn string for two weeks, but I may be able to show ye how such shots should be made. He loosened his long bow, 
slung his quiver round to the front, and then glanced keenly round for a fitting mark. There was a yellow and withered stump some way off, seen under the drooping branches of a lofty oak. The archer measured the distance with his eye, and then, drawing three shafts, he shot them off with such speed that the first had not reached the mark ere the last was on the string. Each arrow passed high over the oak, and, of the three, two stuck fair into the stump, while the third, caught in some wandering puff of wind, was driven a foot or two to one side. Good, cried the north countryman. Hearken to him lads. He is a master bowman. Your dad says amen to every word he says. By my hilt, said Elwood, if I am to preach on bowmanship, the whole long day would scarce give me time for my sermon. We have marksmen in the company who will notch with a shaft every crevice and joint of a man-at-arms harness, from the clasp of his bassinet to the hinge of his greave. But, with your favour, friend, I must gather my arrows again, for while a shaft costs a penny a poor man can scarce leave them sticking in wayside stumps. We must, then, on our road again and I hope from my heart that you may train these two young goshawks here until they are ready for a cast even at such a quarry as you speak of. Leaving the thumbless archer and his brood, the wayfarers struck through the scattered huts of Emery Down, and out onto the broad rolling heath covered deep in ferns and in heather, where droves of the half-wild black forest pigs were rooting about amongst the hillocks. The woods about this point fall away to the left and the right, while the road curves upwards and the wind sweeps keenly over the swelling uplands. The broad strips of bracken glowed red and yellow against the black peaty soil, and a queenly doe who grazed among them turned her white front and her great questioning eyes towards the wayfarers. Aline gazed in admiration at the supple beauty of the creature, but the archer's fingers played with his quiver, and his eyes glistened with the fell instinct which urges a man to slaughter. Teet Dayu, he growled, with his France, or even Guyenne, we should have a fresh haunch for our nun meat. Law or no law, I have a mind to loose a bolt at her. I would break your stave across my knee first, cried John, laying his great hand upon the bow. What? Man, I am forest born, and I know what comes of it. In our own township of Hordle, two have lost their eyes and won his skin for this very thing. On my troth, I felt no great love when I first saw you but since then I have conceived over much regard for you to wish to see the verderer's flayer at work upon you. It is my trade to risk my skin, growled the archer, but nonetheless he thrust his quiver over his hip again and turned his face for the west. As they advanced, the path still tended upwards, running from heath into copses of holly and yew, and so back into heath again. It was joyful to hear the merry whistle of blackbirds as they darted from one clump of greenery to the other. Now and again a peaty amber-coloured stream rippled across their way, with ferny overgrown banks, where the blue kingfisher flitted busily from side to side, or the grey and pensive heron, swollen with trout and dignity, stood ankle-deep among the sedges. Chattering jays and loud wood pigeons flapped thickly overhead, while ever and anon the measured tapping of nature's carpenter, the great green woodpecker, sounded from each wayside grove. On either side, as the path mounted, the long sweep of country broadened and expanded, sloping down on the one side through yellow forest and brown moor to the distant smoke of Limington and the blue misty channel which lay alongside the skyline, while to the north the woods rolled away, grove topping grove, to where in the furthest distance the white spire of Salisbury stood out hard and clear against the cloudless sky. To Aline whose days had been spent in the low-lying coastland, the eager upland air and the wide free countryside gave a sense of life and of the joy of living which made his young blood tingle in his veins. Even the heavy John was not unmoved by the beauty of their road, while the bowmen whistled lustily or sang snatches of French love songs in a voice which might have scared the most stout-hearted maiden that ever hearkened to serenade. I have a liking for that north countryman, he remarked presently. He hath good power of hatred. Couldst see by his cheek and eye that he is as bitter as Verjuice. I warm to a man who hath some gall in his liver. Ah me, sighed Aline. Would it not be better if he had some love in his heart? I would not say nay to that. By my hilt. 
I shall never be said to be traitor to the little king. Let a man love the sex. Pasks die you. They are made to be loved, les petites, from wimple down to shoestring. I am right glad, mon garcon, to see that the good monks have trained thee so wisely and so well. Nay, I meant not worldly love, but rather that his heart should soften towards those who have wronged him. The archer shook his head. A man should love those of his own breed, said he. But it is not nature that an English-born man should love a Scot or a Frenchman. Ma foi. You have not seen a drove of Nithsdale raiders on their Galloway nags, or you would not speak of loving them. I would as soon take Beelzebub himself to my arms. I fear, Mongar, that they have taught thee but badly at Beaulieu, for surely a bishop knows more of what is right and what is ill than an abbot can do, and I myself with these very eyes saw the bishop of Lincoln hew into a Scottish hobbler with a battle-axe, which was a passing strange way of showing him that he loved him. Aline scarce saw his way to argue in the face of so decided an opinion on the part of a high dignitary of the church. You have borne arms against the Scots, then, he asked. Why, man, I first loosed string in battle when I was but a lad, younger by two years than you, at Neville's Cross, under the Lord Mowbray. Later, I served under the warden of Berwick, that very John Copeland of whom our friend spake, the same who held the King of Scots to ransom. Ma foi. It is rough soldiering, and a good school for one who would learn to be hardy and war wise. I have heard that the Scots are good men of war, said Hordle John. For axemen and for spearmen I have not seen their match, the archer answered. They can travel, too, with bag of meal and gridiron slung to their sword belt, so that it is ill to follow them. There are scant crops and few beeves in the borderland, where a man must reap his grain with sickle in one fist and brown bill in the other. On the other hand, they are the sorriest archers that I have ever seen, and cannot so much as aim with the arbalist, to say naught of the longbow. Again, they are mostly poor folk, even the nobles among them, so that there are few who can buy as good a brigandine of chainmail as that which I am wearing, and it is ill for them to stand up against our own knights, who carry the price of five Scotch farms upon their chest and shoulders. Man for man, with equal weapons, they are as worthy and valiant men as could be found in the whole of Christdom. And the French, asked Aline, to whom the archers like gossip had all the relish that the words of the man of action have for the recluse. The French are also very worthy men. We have had great good fortune in France, and it hath led to much bobance and campfire talk, but I have ever noticed that those who know the most have the least to say about it. I have seen Frenchmen fight both in open field, in the intaking and the defending of towns or castle wicks, in escalados, camisades, night forays, bushments, sallies, outfalls, and knightly spear runnings. Their knights and squires, lad, are every whit as good as ours, and I could pick out a score of those who ride behind Du Guesclin who would hold the lists with sharpened lances against the best men in the army of England. On the other hand, their common folk are so crushed down with gabelle, and poltax, and every manner of cursed tallage, that the spirit has passed right out of them. It is a fool's plan to teach a man to be a cur in peace, and think that he will be a lion in war. Fleece them like sheep and sheep they will remain. If the nobles had not conquered the poor folk it is like enough that we should not have conquered the nobles. But they must be sorry folk to bow down to the rich in such a fashion, said Big John. I am but a poor commoner of England myself, and yet I know something of charters, liberties, franchises, usages, privileges, customs, and the like. If these be broken, then all men know that it is time to buy arrowheads. Aye, but the men of the law are strong in France as well as the men of war. By my hilt, I hold that a man has more to fear there from the inkpot of the one than from the iron of the other. There is ever some cursed sheepskin in their strong boxes to prove that the rich man should be richer and the poor man poorer. It would scarce pass in England, but they are quiet folk over the water. And what other nations have you seen in your travels, good sir? asked Aline Edrickson. His young mind hungered for plain facts of life, after the long course of speculation and of mysticism on which he had been trained. 
I have seen the low countryman in arms, and I have naught to say against him. Heavy and slow is he by nature, and is not to be brought into battle for the sake of a lady's eyelash or the twang of a minstrel's string, like the hotter blood of the south. But ma foi! Lay hand on his wool bales, or trifle with his velvet of Bruges, and out buzzes every stout burger, like bees from the tea hole, ready to lay on as though it were his one business in life. By Our Lady! They have shown the French at court why and elsewhere that they are as deft in wielding steel as in welding it. And the men of Spain. They too are very hardy soldiers, the more so as for many hundred years they have had to fight hard against the cursed followers of the Black Mahound, who have pressed upon them from the south, and still, as I understand, hold the fairer half of the country. I had a turn with them upon the sea when they came over to Winchelsea and the good queen with her ladies sat upon the cliffs looking down at us, as if it had been joust or tawny. By my hilt! It was a sight that was worth the seeing, for all that was best in England was out on the water that day. We went forth in little ships and came back in great galleys, for of fifty tall ships of Spain, over two score flew the cross of St. George ere the sun had set. But now, youngster, I have answered you freely and I trow it is time that you answered me. Let things be plat and plain between us. I am a man who shoots straight at his mark. You saw the things I had with me at yonder hostel, name which you will, save only the box of rose-coloured sugar which I take to the Lady Loring, and you shall have it if you will but come with me to France. Nay, said Aline, I would gladly come with you to France or where else you will, just to listen to your talk and because ye are the only two friends that I have in the whole wide world outside of the cloisters, but, indeed, it may not be, for my duty is towards my brother, seeing that father and mother are dead, and he my elder. Besides, when ye talk of taking me to France, ye do not conceive how useless I should be to you, seeing that neither by training nor by nature am I fitted for the wars, and there seems to be naught but strife in those parts. That comes from my fool's talk, cried the archer, for being a man of no learning myself, my tongue turns to blades and targets, even as my hand does. Know then that for every parchment in England there are twenty in France. For every statue, cut gem, shrine, carven screen, or what else might please the eye of a learned clerk, there are a good hundred to our one. At the spoiling of Carcassonne I have seen chambers stored with writing, though not one man in our company could read them. Again, in Arles and Nîmes, and other towns that I could name, there are the great arches and fortalices still standing which were built of old by giant men who came from the south. Can I not see by your brightened eye how you would love to look upon these things? Come then with me, and, by these ten finger bones, there is not one of them which you shall not see. I should indeed love to look upon them, Aline answered, but I have come from Beaulieu for a purpose and I must be true to my service, even as thou art true to thine. Bethink you again, mon Amy, quoth Elwood, that you might do much good yonder, since there are three hundred men in the company, and none who has ever a word of grace for them, and yet the virgin knows that there was never a set of men who were in more need of it. Sickly the one duty may balance the other. Your brother hath done without you this many a year, and, as I gather, he hath never walked as far as Beaulieu to see you during all that time, so he cannot be in any great need of you. Besides, said John, the Sockman of Minstead is a byword through the forest, from Bramshaw Hill to Holmesley Walk. He is a drunken, brawling, perilous churl, as you may find to your cost. The more reason that I should strive to mend him, quoth Aline. There is no need to urge me, friends, for my own wishes would draw me to France, and it would be a joy to me if I could go with you. But indeed and indeed it cannot be, so here I take my leave of you, for yonder square tower amongst the trees upon the right must surely be the church of Minstead, and I may reach it by this path through the woods. Well, God be with thee, lad, cried the archer, pressing a lean to his heart. I am quick to love, and quick to hate and for God I am loath to part. Would it not be well, said John, that we should wait here, and see what manner of greeting you have from your brother? You may prove to be as welcome as the king's purveyor to the village dame. Nay, nay, he answered, ye must not bide for me, for where I go I stay. 
Yet it may be as well that you should know whither we go, said the archer. We shall now journey south through the woods until we come out upon the Christchurch Road, and so onwards, hoping tonight to reach the castle of Sir William Mornacute, Earl of Salisbury, of which Sir Nigel Loring is constable. There we shall bide, and it is like enough that for a month or more you may find us there, ere we are ready for our voyage back to France. It was hard indeed for Aline to break away from these two new but hearty friends, and so strong was the combat between his conscience and his inclinations that he dared not look round, lest his resolution should slip away from him. It was not until he was deep among the tree trunks that he cast a glance backwards, when he found that he could still see them through the branches on the road above him. The archer was standing with folded arms, his bow jutting from over his shoulder, and the sun gleaming brightly upon his headpiece and the links of his chain mail. Beside him stood his giant recruit, still clad in the homespun and ill-fitting garments of the Fuller of Lymington, with arms and legs shooting out of his scanty garb. Even as Aline watched them they turned upon their heels and plodded off together upon their way. Chapter 9 How Strange Things Befell in Minstead Wood The path which the young clerk had now to follow lay through a magnificent forest of the very heaviest timber, where the giant bowls of oak and of beech formed long aisles in every direction, shooting up their huge branches to build the majestic arches of nature's own cathedral. Beneath lay a broad carpet of the softest and greenest moss, flecked over with fallen leaves, but yielding pleasantly to the foot of the traveller. The track which guided him was one so seldom used that in places it lost itself entirely among the grass, to reappear as a reddish rut between the distant tree trunks. It was very still here in the heart of the woodlands. The gentle rustle of the branches and the distant cooing of pigeons were the only sounds which broke in upon the silence, save that once Aline heard afar off a merry call upon a hunting bugle and the shrill yapping of the hounds. It was not without some emotion that he looked upon the scene around him, for, in spite of his secluded life, he knew enough of the ancient greatness of his own family to be aware that the time had been when they had held undisputed and paramount sway over all that tract of country. His father could trace his pure Saxon lineage back to that Godfrey Malf who had held the manors of Biston and of Minstead at the time when the Norman first set mailed foot upon English soil. The afforestation of the district, however, and its conversion into a royal domain had clipped off a large section of his estate while other parts had been confiscated as a punishment for his supposed complicity in an abortive Saxon rising. The fate of the ancestor had been typical of that of his descendants. During three hundred years their domains had gradually contracted, sometimes through royal or feudal encroachment, and sometimes through such gifts to the church as that with which Aline's father had opened the doors of Beaulieu Abbey to his younger son. The importance of the family had thus dwindled, but they still retained the old Saxon manor house, with a couple of farms and a grove large enough to afford panage to a hundred pigs, silver de cent and porces, as the old family parchments describe it. Above all, the owner of the soil could still hold his head high as the veritable Sockman of Minstead, that is, as holding the land in free sockage, with no feudal superior, and answerable to no man lower than the king. Knowing this, Aline felt some little glow of worldly pride as he looked for the first time upon the land with which so many generations of his ancestors had been associated. He pushed on the quicker, twirling his staff merrily, and looking out at every turn of the path for some sign of the old Saxon residence. He was suddenly arrested, however, by the appearance of a wild-looking fellow armed with a club, who sprang out from behind a tree and barred his passage. He was a rough, powerful peasant, with cap and tunic of untanned sheepskin, leather breeches, and galligaskins round legs and feet. Stand, he shouted, raising his heavy cudgel to enforce the order. Who are you who walk so freely through the wood? Whither would you go, and what is your errand? Why should I answer your questions, my friend, said Aline, standing on his guard. Because your tongue may save your pate. But where have I looked upon your face before? No longer ago than last night at the Pied Merlin, the clerk answered, recognizing the escaped serf who had been so outspoken as to his wrongs. By the Virgin? Yes. You are the little clerk who sat so mum in the corner, 
and then cried FY on the gleeman. What a in the script? Not of any price. How can I tell that, Clark? Let me see. Not I. Fool. I could pull you limb from limb like a pullet. What would you have? Ast forgot that we are alone far from all men. How can your clerkship help you? Wouldst lose scrip and life too. I will part with neither without fight. A fight, quotha? A fight betwixt spurred cock and new hatched chicken. Thy fighting days may soon be over. Hadst asked me in the name of charity I would have given freely, cried Aline. As it stands, not one farthing shall you have with my free will, and when I see my brother, the Sockman of Minstead, he will raise hue and cry from vill to vill, from hundred to hundred, until you are taken as a common robber and a scourge to the country. The outlaw sank his club. The Sockman's brother, he gasped. Now, by the keys of Peter. I had rather that hand withered and tongue was palsied ere I had struck or miscalled you. If you are the Sockman's brother you are one of the right side, I warrant, for all your clerkly dress. His brother I am, said Aline. But if I were not, is that reason why you should molest me on the king's ground? I give not the pip of an apple for king or for noble, cried the serf passionately. Ill have I had from them, and ill I shall repay them. I am a good friend to my friends, and, by the virgin, an evil foeman to my foes. And therefore the worst of foemen to thyself, said Aline. But I pray you, since you seem to know him, to point out to me the shortest path to my brother's house. The serf was about to reply, when the clear ringing call of a bugle burst from the wood close behind them, and Aline caught sight for an instant of the dun side and white breast of a lordly stag glancing swiftly betwixt the distant tree trunks. A minute later came the shaggy deer hounds, a dozen or fourteen of them, running on a hot scent, with nose to earth and tail in air. As they streamed past the silent forest around broke suddenly into loud life, with galloping of hoofs, crackling of brushwood, and the short, sharp cries of the hunters. Close behind the pack rode a forier and a yeoman pricker, whooping on the laggards and encouraging the leaders, in the shrill half-French jargon which was the language of venery and woodcraft. Aline was still gazing after them, listening to the loud Heike Bayard. Heike Pomes. Heike Labrit, with which they called upon their favourite hounds, when a group of horsemen crashed out through the underwood at the very spot where the serf and he were standing. The one who led was a man between fifty and sixty years of age, war-worn and weather-beaten, with a broad, thoughtful forehead and eyes which shone brightly from under his fierce and overhung brows. His beard, streaked thickly with grey, bristled forward from his chin, and spoke of a passionate nature, while the long, finely cut face and firm mouth marked the leader of men. His figure was erect and soldierly, and he rode his horse with the careless grace of a man whose life had been spent in the saddle. In common garb, his masterful face and flashing I would have marked him as one who was born to rule, but now, with his silken tunic powdered with golden fleur-de-lis, his velvet mantle lined with the royal miniver, and the lions of England stamped in silver upon his harness, none could fail to recognize the noble Edward, most warlike and powerful of all the long line of fighting monarchs who had ruled the Anglo-Norman race. Aline doffed hat and bowed head at the sight of him, but the serf folded his hands and leaned them upon his cudgel, looking with little love at the knot of nobles and knights-in-waiting who rode behind the king. Ha! cried Edward, reining up for an instant his powerful black steed. La surf ist pass. Non? I see I, broke us, two pals anglais. The dear, clowns, said a hard-visaged, swarthy-faced man, who rode at the king's elbow. If ye have headed it back it is as much as your ears are worth. It passed by the blighted beach there, said Aline, pointing, and the hounds were hard at its heels. It is well, cried Edward, still speaking in French, for, though he could understand English, he had never learned to express himself in so barbarous and unpolished a tongue. By my faith, sirs, he continued, half turning in his saddle to address his escort, unless my woodcraft is sadly at fault, 
it is a stag of six tines and the finest that we have roused this journey. A golden Saint Hubert to the man who is the first to sound the mort. He shook his bridle as he spoke, and thundered away, his knights lying low upon their horses and galloping as hard as whip and spur would drive them, in the hope of winning the king's prize. Away they drove down the long green glade, bay horses, black and grey, riders clad in every shade of velvet, fur, or silk, with glint of brazen horn and flash of knife and spear. One only lingered, the black-browed Baron Brokass, who, making a gambad which brought him within arm sweep of the surf, slashed him across the face with his riding whip. Doff, dog, doff, he hissed, when a monarch deigns to lower his eyes to such as you. Then spurred through the underwood and was gone, with a gleam of steel shoes and flutter of dead leaves. The villain took the cruel blow without wince or cry, as one to whom stripes are a birthright and an inheritance. His eyes flashed, however, and he shook his bony hand with a fierce wild gesture after the retreating figure. Black hound of Gascony, he muttered, evil the day that you and those like you set foot in free England. I know thy kennel of Rochecourt. The night will come when I may do to thee and thine what you and your class have wrought upon mine and me. May God smite me if I fail to smite thee, thou French robber, with thy wife and thy child and all that is under thy castle roof. Forbear, cried Aline. Mix not God's name with these unhallowed threats. And yet it was a coward's blow, and one to stir the blood and loose the tongue of the most peaceful. Let me find some soothing simples and lay them on the wheel to draw the sting. Nay, there is but one thing that can draw the sting, and that the future may bring to me. But, Clark, if you would see your brother you must on, for there is a meeting today, and his merry men will await him ere the shadows turn from west to east. I pray you not to hold him back, for it would be an evil thing if all the stout lads were there and the leader a missing. I would come with you, but sooth to say I am stationed here and may not move. The path over yonder, betwixt the oak and the thorn, should bring you out into his nether field. Aline lost no time in following the directions of the wild, masterless man, whom he left among the trees where he had found him. His heart was the heavier for the encounter, not only because all bitterness and wrath were abhorrent to his gentle nature, but also because it disturbed him to hear his brother spoken of as though he were a chief of outlaws or the leader of a party against the state. Indeed, of all the things which he had seen yet in the world to surprise him there was none more strange than the hate which class appeared to bear to class. The talk of Labour, Woodman and Villain in the inn had all pointed to the widespread mutiny, and now his brother's name was spoken as though he were the very centre of the universal discontent. In good truth, the commons throughout the length and breadth of the land were heart-weary of this fine game of chivalry which had been played so long at their expense. So long as knight and baron were a strength and a guard to the kingdom they might be endured, but now, when all men knew that the great battles in France had been won by English yeomen and Welsh stabbers, warlike fame, the only fame to which his class had ever aspired, appeared to have deserted the plate-clad horsemen. The sports of the lists had done much in days gone by to impress the minds of the people, but the plumed and unwieldy champion was no longer an object either of fear or of reverence to men whose fathers and brothers had shot into the press at Creasy or Poitiers, and seen the proudest chivalry in the world unable to make head against the weapons of disciplined peasants. Power had changed hands. The protector had become the protected, and the whole fabric of the feudal system was tottering to a fall. Hence the fierce mutterings of the lower classes and the constant discontent, breaking out into local tumult and outrage, and culminating some years later in the great rising of Tyler. What Aline saw and wondered at in Hampshire would have appealed equally to the traveller in any other English county from the Channel to the marches of Scotland. He was following the track, his misgivings increasing with every step which took him nearer to that home which he had never seen, when of a sudden the trees began to thin and the sward to spread out onto a broad, green lawn where five cows lay in the sunshine and droves of black swine wandered unchecked. A brown forest stream swirled down the centre of this clearing, with a rude bridge flung across it, and on the other side was a second field sloping up to a long, low-lying wooden house, with thatched roof and open squares for windows. 
Aline gazed across at it with flushed cheeks and sparkling eyes, for this, he knew, must be the home of his father's. A wreath of blue smoke floated up through a hole in the thatch, and was the only sign of life in the place, save a great black hound which lay sleeping chained to the doorpost. In the yellow shimmer of the autumn sunshine it lay as peacefully and as still as he had oft pictured it to himself in his dreams. He was roused, however, from his pleasant reverie by the sound of voices, and two people emerged from the forest some little way to his right and moved across the field in the direction of the bridge. The one was a man with yellow flowing beard and very long hair of the same tint drooping over his shoulders, his dress of good Norwich cloth and his assured bearing marked him as a man of position, while the sombre hue of his clothes and the absence of all ornament contrasted with the flash and glitter which had marked the king's retinue. By his side walked a woman, tall and slight and dark, with lithe, graceful figure and clear-cut, composed features. Her jet-black hair was gathered back under a light pink coif, her head poised proudly upon her neck, and her step long and springy, like that of some wild, tireless woodland creature. She held her left hand in front of her, covered with a red velvet glove, and on the wrist a little brown falcon, very fluffy and bedraggled, which she smoothed and fondled as she walked. As she came out into the sunshine, Aline noticed that her light gown, slashed with pink, was all stained with earth and with moss upon one side from shoulder to hem. He stood in the shadow of an oak staring at her with parted lips, for this woman seemed to him to be the most beautiful and graceful creature that mind could conceive of. Such had he imagined the angels, and such he had tried to paint them in the Beaulieu missiles, but here there was something human, were it only in the battered hawk and discoloured dress, which sent a tingle and thrill through his nerves such as no dream of radiant and stainless spirit had ever yet been able to conjure up. Good, quiet, uncomplaining Mother Nature, long slighted and miscalled, still bides her time and draws to her bosom the most errant of her children. The two walked swiftly across the meadow to the narrow bridge, he in front and she a pace or two behind. There they paused, and stood for a few minutes face to face talking earnestly. Aline had read and had heard of love and of lovers. Such were these, doubtless, this golden-bearded man and the fair damsel with the cold, proud face. Why else should they wander together in the woods, or be so lost in talk by rustic streams? And yet as he watched, uncertain whether to advance from the cover or to choose some other path to the house, he soon came to doubt the truth of this first conjecture. The man stood, tall and square, blocking the entrance to the bridge, and throwing out his hands as he spoke in a wild eager fashion, while the deep tones of his stormy voice rose at times into accents of menace and of anger. She stood fearlessly in front of him, still stroking her bird, but twice she threw a swift questioning glance over her shoulder, as one who is in search of aid. So moved was the young clerk by these mute appeals, that he came forth from the trees and crossed the meadow, uncertain what to do, and yet loath to hold back from one who might need his aid. So intent were they upon each other that neither took note of his approach, until, when he was close upon them, the man threw his arm roughly round the damsel's waist and drew her towards him, she straining her lithe, supple figure away and striking fiercely at him, while the hooded hawk screamed with ruffled wings and pecked blindly in its mistress's defence. Bird and maid, however, had but little chance against their assailant who, laughing loudly, caught her wrist in one hand while he drew her towards him with the other. The best rose has ever the longest thorns, said he. Quiet, little one, or you may do yourself a hurt. Must pay Saxon toll on Saxon land, my proud Maud, for all your airs and graces. You bore, she hissed. You base underbred clod. Is this your care and your hospitality? I would rather wed a branded serf from my father's fields. Leave go, I say, ah. Good youth, heaven has sent you. Make him loose me. By the honour of your mother, I pray you to stand by me and to make this knave loose me. Stand by you I will, and that blithely, said Aline. Surely, sir, you should take shame to hold the damsel against her will. The man turned a face upon him which was lion-like in its strength and in its wrath. With his tangle of golden hair, his fierce blue eyes, and his large, well-marked features, he was the most comely man whom Aline had ever seen, 
and yet there was something so sinister and so fell in his expression that child or beast might well have shrunk from him. His brows were drawn, his cheek flushed, and there was a mad sparkle in his eyes which spoke of a wild, untamable nature. Young fool, he cried, holding the woman still to his side, though every line of her shrinking figure spoke her abhorrence. Do you keep your spoon in your own broth? I read you to go on your way, lest worse befall you. This little wench has come with me and with me she shall bide. Liar, cried the woman, and, stooping her head, she suddenly bit fiercely into the broad brown hand which held her. He whipped it back with an oath, while she tore herself free and slipped behind Aline, cowering up against him like the trembling leveret who sees the falcon poising for the swoop above him. Stand off my land, the man said fiercely, heedless of the blood which trickled freely from his fingers. What have you to do here? By your dress you should be one of those cursed clerks who overrun the land like vile rats, poking and prying into other men's concerns, too caitiff to fight and too lazy to work. By the rude. If I had my will upon ye, I should nail you upon the abbey doors, as they hang vermin before their holes. Art neither man nor woman, young shaveling. Get thee back to thy fellows ere I lay hands upon you, for your foot is on my land, and I may slay you as a common draw latch. Is this your land, then, gasped Aline. Would you dispute it, dog? Would you wish by trick or quibble to juggle me out of these last acres? No, baseborn knave, that you have dared this day to stand in the path of one whose race have been the advisers of kings and the leaders of hosts, ere ever this vile crew of Norman robbers came into the land or such half-blood hounds as you were let loose to preach that the thief should have his booty and the honest man should sin if he strove to win back his own. You are the Sockman of Minstead? That am I, and the son of Edric the Sockman, of the pure blood of Godfrey the Thane, by the only daughter of the house of Alaric, whose forefathers held the white horse banner at the fatal fight where our shield was broken and our sword shivered. I tell you, Clark, that my folk held this land from Bramshaw Wood to the Ringwood Road, and, by the soul of my father, it will be a strange thing if I am to be bearded upon the little that is left of it. Begone, I say, and meddle not with my affair. If you leave me now, whispered the woman, then shame forever upon your manhood. Surely, sir, said Aline, speaking in as persuasive and soothing a way as he could, if your birth is gentle, there is the more reason that your manners should be gentle too. I am well persuaded that you did but jest with this lady, and that you will now permit her to leave your land either alone or with me as a guide, if she should need one, through the wood. As to birth, it does not become me to boast, and there is sooth in what you say as to the unworthiness of clerks, but it is none the less true that I am as well born as you. Doc, cried the furious Sockman, there is no man in the South who can say as much. Yet can I, said Aline smiling, for indeed I also am the son of Edric the Sockman, of the pure blood of Godfrey the Thane, by the only daughter of Alaric of Brockenhurst. Surely, dear brother, he continued, holding out his hand, you have a warmer greeting than this for me. There are but two boughs left upon this old, old Saxon trunk. His elder brother dashed his hand aside with an oath, while an expression of malignant hatred passed over his passion-drawn features. You are the young cub of Beaulieu, then, said he. I might have known it by the sleek face and the slavish manner too monk-ridden and craven in spirit to answer back a rough word. Thy father, Shaveling, with all his faults, had a man's heart, and there were few who could look him in the eyes on the day of his anger. But you! Look there, rat, on yonder field where the cows graze, and on that other beyond, and on the orchard hard by the church. Do you know that all these were squeezed out of your dying father by greedy priests, to pay for your upbringing in the cloisters? I, the Sockman, am shorn of my lands that you may snivel Latin and eat bread for which you never did hands turn. You robbed me first, and now you would come preaching and whining, in search mayhap of another field or two for your priestly friends. Knave! My dogs shall be set upon you, but, meanwhile, stand out of my path and stop me at your peril. As he spoke he rushed forward, and, throwing the lad to one side, 
caught the woman's wrist. Aline, however, as active as a young deerhound, sprang to her aid and seized her by the other arm, raising his iron-shod staff as he did so. You may say what you will to me, he said between his clenched teeth, it may be no better than I deserve, but, brother or no, I swear by my hopes of salvation that I will break your arm if you do not leave hold of the maid. There was a ring in his voice and a flash in his eyes which promised that the blow would follow quick at the heels of the word. For a moment the blood of the long line of hot-headed thanes was too strong for the soft whisperings of the doctrine of meekness and mercy. He was conscious of a fierce wild thrill through his nerves and a throb of mad gladness at his heart, as his real human self burst for an instant the bonds of custom and of teaching which had held it so long. The sockman sprang back looking to left and to right for some stick or stone which might serve him for weapon, but finding none, he turned and ran at the top of his speed for the house, blowing the while upon a shrill whistle. Come, gasped the woman. Fly, friend, ere he come back. Nay, let him come, cried Aline. I shall not budge a foot for him or his dogs. Come, come, she cried, tugging at his arm. I know the man, he will kill you. Come, for the virgin's sake, or for my sake, for I cannot go and leave you here. Come, then, said he, and they ran together to the cover of the woods. As they gained the edge of the brushwood, Aline, looking back, saw his brother come running out of the house again, with the sun gleaming upon his hair and his beard. He held something which flashed in his right hand, and he stooped at the threshold to unloose the black hound. This way, the woman whispered, in a low eager voice. Through the bushes to that forked ash. Do not heed me, I can run as fast as you, I trow. Now into the stream right in, over ankles, to throw the dog off, though I think it is but a common cur, like its master. As she spoke, she sprang herself into the shallow stream and ran swiftly up the centre of it, with the brown water bubbling over her feet and her hand outstretched toward the clinging branches of bramble or sapling. Aline followed close at her heels, with his mind in a whirl at this black welcome and sudden shifting of all his plans and hopes. Yet, grave as were his thoughts, they would still turn to wonder as he looked at the twinkling feet of his guide and saw her lithe figure bend this way and that, dipping under boughs, springing over stones, with a lightness and ease which made it no small task for him to keep up with her. At last, when he was almost out of breath, she suddenly threw herself down upon a mossy bank, between two hollow bushes, and looked ruefully at her own dripping feet and bedraggled skirt. Holy Mary, said she, what shall I do? Mother will keep me to my chamber for a month, and make me work at the tapestry of the nine bold knights. She promised as much last week, when I fell into Wilverley bog, and yet she knows that I cannot abide needlework. Aline, still standing in the stream, glanced down at the graceful pink and white figure, the curve of raven black hair, and the proud, sensitive face which looked up frankly and confidingly at his own. We had best on, he said. He may yet overtake us. Not so. We are well off his land now, nor can he tell in this great wood which way we have taken. But you, you had him at your mercy. Why did you not kill him? Kill him. My brother. And why not? With a quick gleam of her white teeth. He would have killed you. I know him, and I read it in his eyes. Had I had your staff I would have tried I, and done it, too. She shook her clenched white hand as she spoke, and her lips tightened ominously. I am already sad in heart for what I have done, said he, sitting down on the bank and sinking his face into his hands. God help me, all that is worst in me seemed to come up amidst. Another instant, and I had smitten him, the son of my own mother, the man whom I have longed to take to my heart. Alas! That I should still be so weak. Weak, she exclaimed, raising her black eyebrows. I do not think that even my father himself, who is a hard judge of manhood, would call you that. But it is, as you may think, sir, a very pleasant thing for me to hear that you are grieved at what you have done, and I can but read that we should go back together, 
and you should make your peace with the sockman by handing back your prisoner. It is a sad thing that so small a thing as a woman should come between two who are of one blood. Simple Aline opened his eyes at this little spurt of feminine bitterness. Nay, lady, said he, that were worst of all. What man would be so caitiff and thrall as to fail you at your need? I have turned my brother against me, and now, alas, I appear to have given you offence also with my clumsy tongue. But, indeed, lady, I am torn both ways, and can scarce grasp in my mind what it is that has befallen. Nor can I marvel at that, said she, with a little tinkling laugh. You came in as the knight does in the Jonglau's romances, between dragon and damsel, with small time for the asking of questions. Come, she went on, springing to her feet, and smoothing down her rumpled frock, let us walk through the shore together, and we may come upon Bertrand with the horses. If poor Troubadour had not cast a shoe, we should not have had this trouble. Nay, I must have your arm, for, though I speak lightly, now that all is happily over I am as frightened as my brave Roland. See how his chest heaves, and his dear feathers all awry, the little knight who would not have his lady mishandled. So she prattled on to her hawk, while Aline walked by her side, stealing a glance from time to time at this queenly and wayward woman. In silence they wandered together over the velvet turf and on through the broad Minstead woods, where the old lichen-draped beeches threw their circles of black shadow upon the sunlit sward. You have no wish, then, to hear my story, said she, at last. If it pleases you to tell it me, he answered. Oh, she cried tossing her head, if it is of so little interest to you, we had best let it bide. Nay, said he eagerly, I would fain hear it. You have a right to know it, if you have lost a brother's favour through it. And yet, oh well, you are, as I understand, a clerk, so I must think of you as one step further in orders, and make you my father confessor. Know then that this man has been a suitor for my hand, less as I think for my own sweet sake than because he hath ambition and had it on his mind that he might improve his fortunes by dipping into my father's strong box, though the virgin knows that he would have found little enough therein. My father, however, is a proud man, a gallant knight and tried soldier of the oldest blood, to whom this man's churlish birth and low descent oh, lackaday. I had forgot that he was of the same strain as yourself. Nay, trouble not for that, said Aline, we are all from good Mother Eve. Streams may spring from one source, and yet some be clear and some be foul, quoth she quickly. But, to be brief over the matter, my father would have none of his wooing, nor in sooth would I. On that he swore a vow against us, and as he is known to be a perilous man, with many outlaws and others at his back, my father forbade that I should hawk or hunt in any part of the wood to the north of the Christchurch road. As it chanced, however, this morning my little Roland here was loosed at a strong-winged heron, and Page Bertrand and I rode on, with no thoughts but for the sport, until we found ourselves in Minstead Woods. Small harm then, but that my horse Troubadour trod with a tender foot upon a sharp stick, rearing and throwing me to the ground. See to my gown, the third that I have befouled within the week. Woe worth me when Agatha the tirewoman sets eyes upon it. And what then, lady, asked Aline. Why, then away ran Troubadour, for belike I spurred him in falling, and Bertrand rode after him as hard as hoofs could bear him. When I rose there was the sockman himself by my side, with the news that I was on his land, but with so many courteous words besides, and such gallant bearing, that he prevailed upon me to come to his house for shelter there to wait until the page return. By the grace of the Virgin and the help of my patron Saint Magdalene, I stopped short ere I reached his door, though, as you saw, he strove to hail me up to it. And then I h h h. She shivered and chattered like one in an ague fit. What is it? cried Aline, looking about in alarm. Nothing, friend, nothing. I was but thinking how I bit into his hand. Sooner would I bite living toad or poison snake. Oh, I shall loathe my lips forever. But you how brave you were, and how quick. 
how meek for yourself, and how bold for a stranger. If I were a man, I should wish to do what you have done. It was a small thing, he answered, with a tingle of pleasure at these sweet words of praise. But you, what will you do? There is a great oak near here, and I think that Bertrand will bring the horses there, for it is an old hunting tryst of ours. Then hay for home, and no more hawking today. A twelve-mile gallop will dry feet and skirt. But your father? Not one word shall I tell him. You do not know him, but I can tell you he is not a man to disobey as I have disobeyed him. He would avenge me, it is true, but it is not to him that I shall look for vengeance. Some day, perchance, in joust or in tawny, knight may wish to wear my colours, and then I shall tell him that if he does indeed crave my favour there is wrong unredressed, and the wrong are the sockmen of Minstead. So my knight shall find a venture such as bold knights love, and my debt shall be paid, and my father none the wiser, and one rogue the less in the world. Say, is not that a brave plan? Nay, lady, it is a thought which is unworthy of you. How can such as you speak of violence and of vengeance? Are none to be gentle and kind, none to be piteous and forgiving? Alas! It is a hard, cruel world, and I would that I had never left my abbey cell. To hear such words from your lips is as though I heard an angel of grace preaching the devil's own creed. She started from him as a young colt who first feels the bit. Gramercy for your read, young sir, she said, with a little curtsy. As I understand your words, you are grieved that you ever met me, and look upon me as a preaching devil. Why, my father is a bitter man when he is wroth, but hath never called me such a name as that. It may be his right and duty, but certes it is none of thine. So it would be best, since you think so lowly of me, that you should take this path to the left while I keep on upon this one for it is clear that I can be no fit companion for you. So saying, with downcast lids and a dignity which was somewhat marred by her bedraggled skirt, she swept off down the muddy track, leaving Aline standing staring ruefully after her. He waited in vain for some backward glance or sign of relenting, but she walked on with a rigid neck until her dress was only a white flutter among the leaves. Then, with a sunken head and a heavy heart, he plodded wearily down the other path, wroth with himself for the rude and uncouth tongue which had given offence where so little was intended. He had gone some way, lost in doubt and in self-reproach, his mind all tremulous with a thousand newfound thoughts and fears and wonderments, when of a sudden there was a light rustle of the leaves behind him, and, glancing round, there was this graceful, swift-footed creature, treading in his very shadow, with her proud head bowed, even as his was, the picture of humility and repentance. I shall not vex you, nor even speak, she said, but I would fain keep with you while we are in the wood. Nay, you cannot vex me, he answered, all warm again at the very sight of her. It was my rough words which vexed you, but I have been thrown among men all my life, and indeed, with all the wool, I scarce know how to temper my speech to a lady's ear. Then unsay it, cried she quickly, say that I was right to wish to have vengeance on the sockman. Nay, I cannot do that, he answered gravely. Then who is ungentle and unkind now, she cried in triumph. How stern and cold you are for one so young! Art surely no mere clerk, but bishop or cardinal at the least. Shouldst have crozier for staff and mitre for cap. Well, well, for your sake I will forgive the sockman and take vengeance on none but on my own willful self who must needs run into danger's path. So will that please you, sir? There spoke your true self, said he, and you will find more pleasure in such forgiveness than in any vengeance. She shook her head, as if by no means assured of it, and then with a sudden little cry, which had more of surprise than of joy in it, here is Bertrand with the horses. Down the glade there came a little green-clad page with laughing eyes, and long curls floating behind him. He sat perched on a high bay horse, and held on to the bridle of a spirited black palfrey, the hides of both glistening from a long run. I have sought you everywhere, dear Lady Maud, said he in a piping voice, springing down from his horse and holding the stirrup. 
Troubadour galloped as far as home hill ere I could catch him. I trust that you have had no hurt or scaff. He shot a questioning glance at Aline as he spoke. No, Bertrand, said she, thanks to this courteous stranger. And now, sir, she continued, springing into her saddle, it is not fit that I leave you without a word more. Clark or no, you have acted this day as becomes a true knight. King Arthur and all his table could not have done more. It may be that, as some small return, my father or his kin may have power to advance your interest. He is not rich, but he is honoured and hath great friends. Tell me what is your purpose, and see if he may not aid it. Alas! Lady, I have now no purpose. I have but two friends in the world, and they have gone to Christchurch, where it is likely I shall join them. And where is Christchurch? At the castle which is held by the brave knight, Sir Nigel Loring, constable to the Earl of Salisbury. To his surprise she burst out a laughing, and, spurring her palfrey, dashed off down the glade, with her page riding behind her. Not one word did she say, but as she vanished amid the trees she half turned in her saddle and waved a last greeting. Long time he stood, half hoping that she might again come back to him, but the thud of the hoofs had died away, and there was no sound in all the woods but the gentle rustle and dropping of the leaves. At last he turned away and made his way back to the high road another person from the light-hearted boy who had left it a short three hours before. Chapter 10 How Hordle John Found a Man Whom He Might Follow If he might not return to Bowley within the year, and if his brother's dogs were to be set upon him if he showed face upon Minstead land, then indeed he was adrift upon earth. North, south, east, and west he might turn where he would, but all was equally chill and cheerless. The abbot had rolled ten silver crowns in a lettuce leaf and hid them away in the bottom of his scrip, but that would be a sorry support for twelve long months. In all the darkness there was but the one bright spot of the sturdy comrades whom he had left that morning, if he could find them again all would be well. The afternoon was not very advanced, for all that had befallen him. When a man is afoot at cockcrow much may be done in the day. If he walked fast he might yet overtake his friends ere they reached their destination. He pushed on therefore, now walking and now running. As he journeyed he bit into a crust which remained from his bowly bread, and he washed it down by a draught from a woodland stream. It was no easy or light thing to journey through this great forest, which was some twenty miles from east to west and a good sixteen from Bramshaw Woods in the north to Lymington in the south. Aline, however, had the good fortune to fall in with a woodman, axe upon shoulder, trudging along in the very direction that he wished to go. With his guidance he passed the fringe of Boulderwood Walk, famous for old ash and yew, through Mark Ash with its giant beech trees, and on through the Nightwood Groves, where the giant oak was already a great tree, but only one of many comely brothers. They plodded along together, the woodman and Aline, with little talk on either side, for their thoughts were as far asunder as the poles. The peasant's gossip had been of the hunt, of the bracken, of the grey-headed kites that had nested in wood fiddly, and of the great catch of herring brought back by the boats of Pitt's Deep. The clerk's mind was on his brother, on his future above all on this strange, fierce, melting, beautiful woman who had broken so suddenly into his life. Anna suddenly passed out of it again. So. Distray was he and so random his answers, that the woodman took to whistling, and soon branched off upon the track to Burley, leaving Aline upon the main Christchurch road. Down this he pushed as fast as he might, hoping at every turn and rise to catch sight of his companions of the morning. From Vinny Ridge to Rhinefield Walk the woods grow thick and dense up to the very edges of the track but beyond the country opens up into broad dun-coloured moors, flecked with clumps of trees, and topping each other in long, low curves up to the dark lines of forest in the furthest distance. Clouds of insects danced and buzzed in the golden autumn light, and the air was full of the piping of the songbirds. Long, glinting dragonflies shot across the path, or hung tremulous with gauzy wings and gleaming bodies. Once a white-necked sea eagle soared screaming high over the traveller's head, and again a flock of brown bustards popped up from among the bracken, and blundered away in their clumsy fashion, half running, 
half flying, with strident cry and whir of wings. There were folk, too, to be met upon the road, beggars and couriers, chapmen and tinkers, cheery fellows for the most part, with a rough jest and homely greeting for each other and for Aline. Near Shotwood he came upon five seamen, on their way from Poole to Southampton, rude red-faced men, who shouted at him in a jargon which he could scarce understand, and held out to him a great pot from which they had been drinking, nor would they let him pass until he had dipped pannikin in and taken a mouthful, which set him coughing and choking, with the tears running down his cheeks. Further on he met a sturdy black-bearded man, mounted on a brown horse, with a rosary in his right hand and a long two-handed sword jangling against his stirrup iron. By his black robe and the eight-pointed cross upon his sleeve, Aline recognized him as one of the knights hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem, whose presbytery was at Baddesley. He held up two fingers as he passed, with a benedic, Philly am I. Whereat Aline doffed hat and bent knee, looking with much reverence at one who had devoted his life to the overthrow of the infidel. Poor simple lad. He had not learned yet that what men are and what men profess to be are very wide asunder, and that the knights of St. John, having come into large part of the riches of the ill-fated Templars, were very much too comfortable to think of exchanging their palace for a tent, or the cellars of England for the thirsty deserts of Syria. Yet ignorance may be more precious than wisdom, for Aline as he walked on braced himself to a higher life by the thought of this other's sacrifice, and strengthened himself by his example which he could scarce have done had he known that the hospitaller's mind ran more upon Malmsey than on Mamelukes, and on venison rather than victories. As he pressed on the plain turned to woods once more in the region of Wolverley Walk, and a cloud swept up from the south with the sun shining through the chinks of it. A few great drops came pattering loudly down, and then in a moment the steady swish of a brisk shower, with the dripping and dropping of the leaves. Aline, glancing round for shelter, saw a thick and lofty holly bush, so hollowed out beneath that no house could have been drier. Under this canopy of green two men were already squatted, who waved their hands to Aline that he should join them. As he approached he saw that they had five dried herrings laid out in front of them, with a great hunch of wheat and bread and a leathern flask full of milk, but instead of setting to at their food they appeared to have forgot all about it, and were disputing together with flushed faces and angry gestures. It was easy to see by their dress and manner that they were two of those wandering students who formed about this time so enormous a multitude in every country in Europe. The one was long and thin, with melancholy features, while the other was fat and sleek, with a loud voice and the air of a man who is not to be gainsaid. Come hither, good youth, he cried, come hither. Voltus ingenui pure. He'd not the face of my good cause here. Phonum habit in corn you, as Don Horace has it, but I warrant him harmless for all that. Stint your bulls bellowing, exclaimed the other. If it come to Horace, I have a line in my mind, Loquis's si sapiat, how doth it run? The English OT being that a man of sense should ever avoid a great talker. That being so, if all were men of sense then thou wouldst be a lonesome man, cuz. Alas! Dicon, I fear that your logic is as bad as your philosophy or your divinity, and God what it would be hard to say a worse word than that for it. For, hark ye, granting, propter argumentum, that I am a talker, then the true reasoning runs that since all men of sense should avoid me, and thou hast not avoided me, but that at the present moment eating herrings with me under a holly bush, ergo you are no man of sense, which is exactly what I have been dinning into your long ears ever since I first clapped eyes on your sunken chops. Tut, tut, cried the other. Your tongue goes like the clapper of a mill wheel. Sit down here, friend, and partake of this herring. Understand first, however, that there are certain conditions attached to it. I had hoped, said Aline, falling into the humour of the twain, that a tranquire of bread and a draught of milk might be attached to it. Hark to him, hark to him, cried the little fat man. It is even thus, Dicon. Wit, lad, is a catching thing, like the itch or the sweating sickness. I exude it round me, it is an aura. I tell you, cuz, that no man can come within seventeen feet of me without catching a spark. Look at your own case. A duller man never stepped, 
and yet within the week you have said three things which might pass, and one thing the day we left Fordingbridge which I should not have been ashamed of myself. Enough, Rattlepate, enough, said the other. The milk you shall have and the bread also, friend, together with the herring, but you must hold the scales between us. If he hold the herring he holds the scales, my sapient brother, cried the fat man. But I pray you, good youth, to tell us whether you are a learned clerk, and, if so, whether you have studied at Oxenford or at Paris. I have some small stock of learning, Aline answered, picking at his herring, but I have been at neither of these places. I was bred amongst the Cistercian monks at Beaulieu Abbey. Pooh, pooh, they cried both together. What sort of an upbringing is that? Non quivis contingit a dia Corinthum, quoth Aline. Come, brother Stephen, he hath some tincture of letters, said the melancholy man more hopefully. He may be the better judge, since he hath no call to side with either of us. Now, attention, friend, and let your ears work as well as your nether jaw. Judex damnata, you know the old saw. Here am I upholding the good fame of the learned Dun Scotus against the foolish quibblings and poor silly reasonings of Willie Ockham. While I, quoth the other loudly, do maintain the good sense and extraordinary wisdom of that most learned William against the crack-brained fantasies of the muddy Scotchman, who hath hid such little wit as he has under so vast a pile of words, that it is like one drop of Gascony in a firkin of ditch water. Solomon his wisdom would not suffice to say what the rogue means. Certes, Stephen Hapgood, his wisdom doth not suffice, cried the other. It is as though a mole cried out against the morning star, because he could not see it. But our dispute, friend, is concerning the nature of that subtle essence which we call thought. For I hold with the learned Scotus that thought is in very truth a thing, even as vapour or fumes, or many other substances which our gross bodily eyes are blind to. For, look you, that which produces a thing must be itself a thing, and if a man's thought may produce a written book, then must thought itself be a material thing, even as the book is. Have I expressed it? Do I make it plain? Whereas I hold, shouted the other, with my revered preceptor, doctor, preclarisit excellentissimus, that all things are but thought, for when thought is gone I pry thee where are the things then? Here are trees about us, and I see them because I think I see them, but if I have swooned, or sleep, or am in wine, then, my thought having gone forth from me, lo the trees go forth also. How now, cuz, have I touched thee on the raw? Aline sat between them munching his bread, while the twain disputed across his knees, leaning forward with flushed faces and darting hands, in all the heat of argument. Never had he heard such jargon of scholastic philosophy, such fine-drawn distinctions, such cross-fire of major and minor, proposition, syllogism, attack and refutation. Question clattered upon answer like a sword on a buckler. The ancients, the fathers of the church, the moderns, the scriptures, the Arabians, were each sent hurtling against the other, while the rain still dripped and the dark hollow leaves glistened with the moisture. At last the fat man seemed to weary of it, for he set to work quietly upon his meal, while his opponent, as proud as the rooster who is left unchallenged upon the midden, crowed away in a last long burst of quotation and deduction. Suddenly, however, his eyes dropped upon his food, and he gave a howl of dismay. You double thief! he cried, you have eaten my herrings, and I without bite or sup since morning. That, quoth the other complacently, was my final argument, my crowning effort, or peroratio, as the orators have it. For, cuz, since all thoughts are things, you have but to think a pair of herrings, and then conjure up a pottle of milk wherewith to wash them down. A brave piece of reasoning, cried the other, and I know of but one reply to it. On which, leaning forward, he caught his comrade a rousing smack across his rosy cheek. Nay, take it not amiss, he said, since all things are but thoughts, then that also is but a thought and may be disregarded. This last argument, however, by no means commended itself to the pupil of Ockham, 
who plucked a great stick from the ground and signified his descent by smiting the realist over the pate with it. By good fortune, the wood was so light and rotten that it went to a thousand splinters, but Aline thought it best to leave the twain to settle the matter at their leisure, the more so as the sun was shining brightly once more. Looking back down the pool-strewn road, he saw the two excited philosophers waving their hands and shouting at each other, but their babble soon became a mere drone in the distance, and a turn in the road hid them from his sight. And now after passing Holmes Lay Walk and the Wooten Heath, the forest began to shred out into scattered belts of trees, with gleam of cornfield and stretch of pastureland between. Here and there by the wayside stood little knots of wattle and daub huts with shock-haired laborious lounging by the doors and red-cheeked children sprawling in the roadway. Back among the groves he could see the high gable ends and thatched roofs of the Franklin's houses, on whose fields these men found employment, or more often a thick dark column of smoke marked their position and hinted at the coarse plenty within. By these signs Aline knew that he was on the very fringe of the forest, and therefore no great way from Christchurch. The sun was lying low in the west and shooting its level rays across the long sweep of rich green country, glinting on the white-fleeced sheep and throwing long shadows from the red kine who waded knee-deep in the juicy clover. Right glad was the traveller to see the high tower of Christchurch Priory gleaming in the mellow evening light, and gladder still when, on rounding a corner, he came upon his comrades of the morning seated astraddle upon a fallen tree. They had a flat space before them, on which they alternately threw little square pieces of bone, and were so intent upon their occupation that they never raised eye as he approached them. He observed with astonishment, as he drew near, that the archer's bow was on John's back, the archer's sword by John's side, and the steel cap laid upon the tree trunk between them. Mort de Marvaille! Elwood shouted, looking down at the dice. Never had I such cursed luck. A moraine on the bones? I have not thrown a good main since I left Navarre. A one and a three. Ian Avant, camarade. For and three, cried Hordle John, counting on his great fingers, that makes seven. Ho, archer, I have thy cap. Now have at thee for thy jerkin. Mon die you, he growled, I am like to reach Christ's church in my shirt. Then suddenly glancing up, Ola, by the splendor of heaven, here is our cher petit. Now, by my ten finger bones. This is a rare sight to mine eyes. He sprang up and threw his arms round Aline's neck, while John, no less pleased, but more backward and Saxon in his habits, stood grinning and bobbing by the wayside, with his newly won steel cap stuck wrong side foremost upon his tangle of red hair. Ast come to stop, cried the bowman, patting Aline all over in his delight. Shall not get away from us again. I wish no better, said he, with a pringling in the eyes at this hearty greeting. Well said, lad, cried Big John. We three shall to the walls together, and the devil may fly away with the abbot of Beaulieu. But your feet and hosen are all besmudged. Hast been in the water, or I am the more mistaken. I have in good sooth, Aline answered, and then as they journeyed on their way he told them the many things that had befallen him, his meeting with the villain, his sight of the king, his coming upon his brother, with all the tale of the black welcome and of the fair damsel. They strode on either side, each with an ear slanting towards him, but ere he had come to the end of his story the bowman had spun round upon his heel, and was hastening back the way they had come, breathing loudly through his nose. What then? asked Aline, trotting after him and gripping at his jerkin. I am back for Minstead, lad. And why, in the name of sense? To thrust a handful of steel into the sockman. What? Hail a demoiselle against her will, and then loose dogs at his own brother. Let me go. Nenny, nenny, cried Aline, laughing. There was no scath done. Come back, friend, and so, by mingled pushing and entreaties, they got his head round for Christchurch once more. Yet he walked with his chin upon his shoulder, until, catching sight of a maiden by a wayside well, the smiles came back to his face and peace to his heart. But you, said Aline, there have been changes with you also. 
Why should not the workman carry his tools? Where are bow and sword and cap, and why so warlike, John? It is a game which friend Elwood hath been a teaching of me. And I found him an overapt pupil, grumbled the bowman. He hath stripped me as though I had fallen into the hands of the tarred Venus. But, by my hilt, you must render them back to me, camarade, lest you bring discredit upon my mission, and I will pay you for them at armor's prices. Take them back, man, and never heed the pay, said John. I did but wish to learn the feel of them, since I am like to have such trinkets hung to my own girdle for some years to come. Ma foi, he was born for a free companion, cried Elwood, he hath the very trick of speech and turn of thought. I take them back then, and indeed it gives me unease not to feel my you stave tapping against my leg bone. But see, Ms. Garcons, on this side of the church rises the square and darkling tower of Earl Salisbury's castle, and even from here I seem to see on yonder banner the red roebuck of the Montacutes. Red upon white, said Aline, shading his eyes, but whether roebuck or no is more than I could vouch. How black is the great tower, and how bright the gleam of arms upon the wall! See below the flag, how it twinkles like a star! Aye, it is the steel headpiece of the watchman, remarked the archer. But we must on, if we are to be there before the drawbridge rises at the Vesper's bugle, for it is likely that Sir Nigel, being so renowned a soldier, may keep hard discipline within the walls, and let no man enter after sundown. So saying, he quickened his pace, and the three comrades were soon close to the straggling and broad-spread town which centred round the noble church and the frowning castle. It chanced on that very evening that Sir Nigel Loring, having supped before sunset, as was his custom, and having himself seen that Pomus and Cadsand, his two warhorses, with the thirteen hacks, the five genets, my lady's three palfreys, and the great dapple grey rusin, had all their needs supplied, had taken his dogs for an evening breather. Sixty or seventy of them, large and small, smooth and shaggy deerhound, boarhound, bloodhound, wolfhound, mastiff, Alorn, Talbot, Lurcher, Terrier, Spaniel snapping, yelling and whining, with score of lolling tongues and waving tails, came surging down the narrow lane which leads from the Twinham Kennels to the Bank of Avon. Two russet-clad varlets, with loud halloo and cracking whips, walked thigh-deep amid the swarm, guiding, controlling, and urging. Behind came Sir Nigel himself, with Lady Loring upon his arm, the pair walking slowly and sedately, as befitted both their age and their condition, while they watched with a smile in their eyes the scrambling crowd in front of them. They paused, however, at the bridge, and, leaning their elbows upon the stonework, they stood looking down at their own faces in the glassy stream, and at the swift flash of speckled trout against the tawny gravel. Sir Nigel was a slight man of poor stature, with soft lisping voice and gentle ways. So short was he that his wife, who was no very tall woman, had the better of him by the breadth of three fingers. His sight having been injured in his early wars by a basketful of lime which had been emptied over him when he led the Earl of Derby's stormers up the breach at Bergerac, he had contracted something of a stoop, with a blinking, peering expression of face. His age was six and forty, but the constant practice of arms, together with a cleanly life, had preserved his activity and endurance unimpaired so that from a distance he seemed to have the slight limbs and swift grace of a boy. His face, however, was tanned of a dull yellow tint, with a leathery, poreless look, which spoke of rough outdoor doings, and the little pointed beard which he wore, in deference to the prevailing fashion, was streaked and shot with grey. His features were small, delicate, and regular, with clear-cut, curving nose, and eyes which jutted forward from the lids. His dress was simple and yet spruce. A Flandrish hut of Bever, bearing in the band the token of Our Lady of Embron, was drawn low upon the left side to hide that ear which had been partly shorn from his head by a Flemish man-at-arms in a camp broil before Tournay. His coat hardy, or tunic, and trunk hosen were of a purple plum colour, with long weepers which hung from either sleeve to below his knees. His shoes were of red leather, daintily pointed at the toes but not yet prolonged to the extravagant lengths which the succeeding reign was to bring into fashion. 
A gold embroidered belt of knighthood encircled his loins, with his arms, five roses gules on a field argent, cunningly worked upon the clasp. So stood Sir Nigel lawing upon the bridge of Avon, and talked lightly with his lady. And, certes, had the two visages alone been seen, and the stranger been asked which were the more likely to belong to the bold warrior whose name was loved by the roughest soldiery of Europe, he had assuredly selected the ladies. Her face was large and square and red, with fierce, thick brows, and the eyes of one who was accustomed to rule. Taller and broader than her husband, her flowing gown of sendal, and fur-lined tippet, could not conceal the gaunt and ungraceful outlines of her figure. It was the age of martial women. The deeds of Black Agnes of Dunbar, of Lady Salisbury and of the Countess of Montfort, were still fresh in the public minds. With such examples before them the wives of the English captains had become as warlike as their mates, and ordered their castles in their absence with the prudence and discipline of veteran seneschals. Right easy were the Montacutes of their castle of Twinham, and little had they to dread from roving galley or French squadron, while Lady Mary Loring had the ordering of it. Yet even in that age it was thought that, though a lady might have a soldier's heart, it was scarce as well that she should have a soldier's face. There were men who said that of all the stern passages and daring deeds by which Sir Nigel Loring had proved the true temper of his courage, not the least was his wooing and winning of so forbidding a dame. I tell you, my fair lord, she was saying, that it is no fit training for a demoiselle, hawks and hounds, rotes and satoli singing a French rondel, or reading the jests de dune de mayence, as I found her yesternight, pretending sleep, the artful, with the corner of the scroll thrusting forth from under her pillow. Lent her by Father Christopher of the Priory, forsooth, that is ever her answer. How shall all this help her when she has castle of her own to keep, with a hundred mouths all agape for beef and beer? True, my sweet bird, true, answered the knight, picking a comfort from his gold drachois. The maid is like the young filly, which kicks heels and plunges for very lust of life. Give her time. Dame, give her time. Well, I know that my father would have given me, not time, but a good hazel stick across my shoulders. Ma foi. I know not what the world is coming to, when young maids may flout their elders. I wonder that you do not correct her, my fair lord. Nay, my heart's comfort, I never raised hand to woman yet, and it would be a passing strange thing if I began on my own flesh and blood. It was a woman's hand which cast this lime into mine eyes, and though I saw her stoop, and might well have stopped her ere she threw, I deemed it unworthy of my knighthood to hinder or balk one of her sex. The hussy, cried Lady Loring clenching her broad right hand. I would I had been at the side of her. And so would I, since you would have been the nearer me my own. But I doubt not that you are right, and that Maud's wings need clipping, which I may leave in your hands when I am gone. For, in sooth, this peaceful life is not for me, and were it not for your gracious kindness and loving care I could not abide it a week. I hear that there is talk of warlike muster at Bordeaux once more, and by St. Paul. It would be a new thing if the lions of England and the red pile of Chandos were to be seen in the field, and the roses of Loring were not waving by their side. Now well worth me but I feared it, cried she, with the colour all struck from her face. I have noted your absent mind, your kindling eye, your trying and riveting of old harness. Consider, my sweet lord, that you have already won much honour, that we have seen but little of each other, that you bear upon your body the scar of over twenty wounds received in I know not how many bloody encounters. Have you not done enough for honour and the public cause? My lady, when our liege lord, the king, at three score years, and my lord Chandos at three score and ten, are blithe and ready to lay lance in rest for England's cause, it would ill beseem me to prate of service done. It is sooth that I have received seven and twenty wounds. There is the more reason that I should be thankful that I am still long of breath and sound in limb. I have also seen some bickering and scuffling. Six great land battles I count, with four upon sea, and seven and fifty on falls, skirmishes, and bushments. I have held two and twenty towns, and I have been at the intaking of thirty-one. Surely then it would be bitter shame to me, and also to you, 
since my fame is yours, that I should now hold back if a man's work is to be done. Besides, bethink you how low is our purse, with bailiff and reeve ever croaking of empty farms and wasting lands. Were it not for this constableship which the Earl of Salisbury hath bestowed upon us we could scarce uphold the state which is fitting to our degree. Therefore, my sweeting, there is the more need that I should turn to where there is good pay to be earned and brave ransoms to be won. Ah, my dear lord, quoth she, with sad, weary eyes. I thought that at last I had you to mine own self, even though your youth had been spent afar from my side. Yet my voice, as I know well, should speed you on to glory and renown, not hold you back when fame is to be won. Yet what can I say, for all men know that your valour needs the curb and not the spur. It goes to my heart that you should ride forth now a mere knight bachelor, when there is no noble in the land who hath so good a claim to the square pennon, save only that you have not the money to uphold it. And whose fault that, my sweet bird, said he? No fault, my fair lord, but a virtue, for how many rich ransoms have you won, and yet have scattered the crowns among page and archer and varlet, until in a week you had not as much as would buy food and forage. It is a most knightly largesse, and yet without an money how can man rise? Dirt and dross, cried he. What matter rise or fall, so that duty be done and honour gained? Banner it or bachelor, square pennon or forked, I would not give a denier for the difference, and the less since Sir John Chandos, chosen flower of English chivalry, is himself but a humble knight. But meanwhile fret not thyself, my heart's dove, for it is like that there may be no war waged, and we must await the news. But here are three strangers, and one, as I take it, a soldier fresh from service. It is likely that he may give us word of what is stirring over the water. Lady Loring, glancing up, saw in the fading light three companions walking abreast down the road, all grey with dust, and stained with travel, yet chattering merrily between themselves. He in the midst was young and comely, with boyish open face and bright grey eyes, which glanced from right to left as though he found the world around him both new and pleasing. To his right walked a huge red-headed man, with broad smile and merry twinkle, whose clothes seemed to be bursting and splitting at every seam, as though he were some lusty chick who was breaking bravely from his shell. On the other side, with his knotted hand upon the young man's shoulder, came a stout and burly archer, brown and fierce-eyed, with sword at belt and long yellow yew stave peeping over his shoulder. Hard face, battered headpiece, dinted brigandine, with faded red lion of St. George ramping on a discoloured ground, all proclaimed as plainly as words that he was indeed from the land of war. He looked keenly at Sir Nigel as he approached, and then, plunging his hand under his breastplate, he stepped up to him with a rough, uncouth bow to the lady. Your pardon, fair sir, said he, but I know you the moment I clap eyes on you, though in sooth I have seen you oftener in steel than in velvet. I have drawn string besides you at La Roche d'Arian, Romorantin, Morpetuis, Nogent, Aurie, and other places. Then, good archer, I am right glad to welcome you to Twinham Castle, and in the steward's room you will find Provant for yourself and comrades. To me also your face is known, though mine eyes play such tricks with me that I can scarce be sure of my own squire. Rest a while, and you shall come to the hall anon and tell us what is passing in France, for I have heard that it is likely that our pennons may flutter to the south of the great Spanish mountains ere another year be passed. There was talk of it in Bordeaux, answered the archer, and I saw myself that the armourers and smiths were as busy as rats in a wheat rick. But I bring you this letter from the valiant Gascon knight, Sir Claude Latour. And to you, lady, he added after a pause, I bring from him this box of red sugar of Narbonne, with every courteous and knightly greeting which a gallant cavalier may make to a fair and noble dame. This little speech had cost the blunt bowman much pains and planning, but he might have spared his breath, for the lady was quite as much absorbed as her lord in the letter, which they held between them, a hand on either corner, spelling it out very slowly with drawn brows and muttering lips. As they read it, Aline, who stood with Hordle John a few paces back from their comrade, saw the lady catch her breath, while the knight laughed softly to himself.
You see, dear heart, said he, that they will not leave the old dog in his kennel when the game is afoot. And what of this white company, Archer? Ah, sir, you speak of dogs, cried Elwood, but there are a pack of lusty hounds who are ready for any quarry, if they have but a good huntsman to halloo them on. Sir, we have been in the wars together, and I have seen many a brave following but never such a set of woodland boys as this. They do but want you at their head, and who will bar the way to them? Pardieu, said Sir Nigel, if they are all like their messenger, they are indeed men of whom a leader may be proud. Your name, good archer? Sam Elwood, sir, of the Hundred of Easebourne and the Rape of Chichester. And this giant behind you? He is Big John, of Hordle, a forest man, who hath now taken service in the company. A proper figure of a man at arms, said the little knight. Why, man, you are no chicken, yet I warrant him the stronger man. See to that great stone from the coping which hath fallen upon the bridge. For of my lazy varlet strove this day to carry it hence. I would that you two could put them to shame by budging it, though I fear that I overtask you, for it is of a grievous weight. He pointed as he spoke to a huge rough-hewn block which lay by the roadside, deep sunken from its own weight in the reddish earth. The archer approached it, rolling back the sleeves of his jerkin, but with no very hopeful countenance, for indeed it was a mighty rock. John, however, put him aside with his left hand, and, stooping over the stone, he plucked it single-handed from its soft bed and swung it far into the stream. There it fell with mighty splash, one jagged end peeking out above the surface, while the waters bubbled and foamed with far-circling eddy. Good lack, cried Sir Nigel, and good lack, cried his lady, while John stood laughing and wiping the cake dirt from his fingers. I have felt his arms round my ribs, said the bowman, and they crackle yet at the thought of it. This other comrade of mine is a right learned clerk, for all that he is so young, high to lean, the son of Edric, brother to the Sockman of Minstead. Young man, quoth Sir Nigel, sternly, if you are of the same way of thought as your brother, you may not pass under portcullis of mine. Nay, fair sir, cried Elwood hastily, I will be pledged for it that they have no thought in common, for this very day his brother hath set his dogs upon him, and driven him from his lands. And are you, too, of the White Company, asked Sir Nigel. Ast had small experience of war, if I may judge by your looks and bearing. I would fain to France with my friends here, Aline answered, but I am a man of peace, a reader, exorcist, acolyte, and clerk. That need not hinder, quoth Sir Nigel. No, fair sir, cried the bowman joyously. Why, I myself have served two terms with Arnold de Savoles, he whom they called the archpriest. By my hilt. I have seen him ere now, with monk's gown trussed to his knees, over his sandals in blood in the forefront of the battle. Yet, ere the last string had twanged, he would be down on his four bones among the stricken, and have them all houseled and shriven, as quick as shelling peas. Ma foi. There were those who wished that he would have less care for their souls and a little more for their bodies. It is well to have a learned clerk in every troop, said Sir Nigel. By St. Paul, there are men so caitiff that they think more of a scrivener's pen than of their lady's smile and do their devoir in hopes that they may fill a line in a chronicle or make a tag to a Jean Glau's romance. I remember well that, at the siege of Retters, there was a little, sleek, fat clerk of the name of Chaucer, who was so apt at Rondel, Savent, or Tunsun, that no man dare give back a foot from the walls, lest he find it all set down in his rhymes and sung by every underling and violet in the camp. But, my soul's bird, you hear me prate as though all were decided, when I have not yet taken counsel either with you or with my lady mother. Let us to the chamber, while these strangers find such fare as pantry and cellar may furnish. The night air strikes chill, said the lady, and turned down the road with her hand upon her lord's arm. The three comrades dropped behind and followed, Elwood much the lighter for having accomplished his mission, Aline full of wonderment at the humble bearing of so renowned a captain 
and John loud with snorts and sneers, which spoke his disappointment and contempt. What ails the man? asked Elwood in surprise. I have been cousined and bejaped, quoth he gruffly. By whom, Sir Samson the Strong? By thee, Sir Balaam the False Prophet. By my hilt, cried the archer, though I be not Balaam, yet I hold converse with the very creature that spake to him. What is amiss, then, and how have I played you false? Why, marry, did you not say, and Aline here will be my witness, that, if I would hie to the wars with you, you would place me under a leader who was second to none in all England for valour. Yet here you bring me to a shred of a man, peaky and ill-nourished, with eyes like a molting owl, who must needs, forsooth, take counsel with his mother ere he buckle sword to girdle. Is that where the shoe galls, cried the bowman, and laughed aloud. I will ask you what you think of him three months hence, if we be all alive, for sure I am that. Elwood's words were interrupted by an extraordinary hubbub which broke out that instant some little way down the street in the direction of the priory. There was deep-mouthed shouting of men, frightened shrieks of women, howling and barking of curs, and over all a sullen, thunderous rumble, indescribably menacing and terrible. Round the corner of the narrow street there came rushing a brace of whining dogs with tails tucked under their legs, and after them a white-faced burger, with outstretched hands and wide-spread fingers, his hair all a bristle and his eyes glinting back from one shoulder to the other, as though some great terror were at his very heels. Fly, my lady, fly, he screeched, and whizzed past them like bolt from bow, while close behind came lumbering a huge black bear, with red tongue lolling from his mouth, and a broken chain jangling behind him. To right and left the folk flew for arch and doorway. Hordle John caught up the lady lawing as though she had been a feather and sprang with her into an open porch, while Elwood, with a whirl of French oaths, plucked at his quiver and tried to unsling his bow. Aline, all unnerved at so strange and unwonted a sight, shrunk up against the wall with his eyes fixed upon the frenzied creature, which came bounding along with ungainly speed, looking the larger in the uncertain light, its huge jaws agape, with blood and slaver trickling to the ground. Sir Nigel alone, unconscious to all appearance of the universal panic, walked with unfaltering step up the centre of the road, a silken handkerchief in one hand and his gold comfort box in the other. It sent the blood cold through Aline's veins to see that as they came together, the man and the beast, the creature reared up, with eyes ablaze with fear and hate, and whirled its great paws above the night to smite him to the earth. He, however, blinking with puckered eyes, reached up his kerchief, and flicked the beast twice across the snout with it. Ah, saucy! Saucy, quoth he, with gentle chiding, on which the bear, uncertain and puzzled, dropped its four legs to earth again, and, waddling back, was soon swathed in ropes by the bear ward and a crowd of peasants who had been in close pursuit. A scared man was the keeper, for, having chained the brute to a stake while he drank a stupor veil at the inn, it had been baited by stray curs, until, in wrath and madness, it had plucked loose the chain and smitten or bitten all who came in its path. Most scared of all was he to find that the creature had come nigh to harm the lord and lady of the castle, who had power to place him in the stretch neck or to have the skin scourged from his shoulders. Yet, when he came with bowed head and humble entreaty for forgiveness, he was met with a handful of small silver from Sir Nigel, whose dame, however, was less charitably disposed, being much ruffled in her dignity by the manner in which she had been hustled from her lord's side. As they passed through the castle gate, John plucked at Elwood's sleeve, and the two fell behind. I must crave your pardon, comrade, said he, bluntly. I was a fool not to know that a little rooster may be the gamest. I believe that this man is indeed a leader whom we may follow. <laughs>